Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm reading a new book called Life is in the Transitions, and it's a recent New York Times bestseller. And the, the author states that life's disruptions <laughs> happen more frequently than most people see a dentist. Now, that's got all sorts of ramifications to it, but, but just think about that for a second. That if we expect that everything will always be trending up and to the right, then I'm afraid we're all going to be sorely disappointed. Life is really lived in learning to respond to, you might call it the good news, bad news transitions. And our story today uh, about the life of Joseph, as we continue in part two, is a story of good news, bad news transitions. Last week we learned that uh, he is one of 13 kids. He's got 11 brothers and one sister, and her name is Dinah. And uh, he is his daddy's favorite. That's very good. Well, maybe actually not, because unfortunately, his brothers hate his guts. That's very bad. His daddy gives him a beautiful coat. That seems very good. <laughs> but of course, his brothers are jealous, and they rip it off, and then they pretend he's dead, and then they sell him into slavery in a distant land, and, and, and that's very bad. And that's where we ended last week. We, we, we've, and now we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 39. I'm going to read the first verse for you here. It says, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, the, the good news and bad news pattern continues, doesn't it? He goes to work for Potiphar, who's this high-ranking, wealthy Egyptian official, and Potiphar likes him, and Joseph is, is an excellent manager. He ends up in charge of everything. He's a, he's a tremendous success. We're, plus, we're told he's very handsome, and that's very good. And that's the good news, bad news circumstances of Joseph's life's just continuing. Um, all of our lives have these good news and bad news in them. And some we can control and some we just can't. Some come out of the blue. We all have good news and bad news, but uh, our lives are written as how we respond. That's what's most important. And that will be our legacy when our narratives are written one day. Reminds me of the story of a man who left church early uh, before the service was over, and outside he meets this friend who asked, is the preacher done yet? And the man replied, yes, the good news, he's done. He's been done for quite a while. The bad news is that he hasn't stopped talking, though. Ha. Huh. Well, life has good news and bad news. You see, Joseph started life with a dream. He was a leader. Joseph never thought he would be sold into slavery. But now he's a slave in a foreign country, away from his family. He's got no money, no power, and no connections. Yet he, he learns something vital that's vital to all of us. It's a, a lesson all over the pages of Scripture that, that our heart is really revealed and our character is really revealed forged when life doesn't turn out like we've planned it. Can you relate to Joseph? Well, I, I can. I'm sure we all can. Things in our lives just don't happen the way we want them to sometimes. It might be our work. It might be our marriage. It might be our parents and our kids. Uh, it might be our finances. It might be our health. Uh, or you fill in the blank, something you can add to that. I think we can all relate. In the midst of it all, Joseph encounters at least three different decision points, three different crossroads that I think require a response. They're crossroads that come to all of us when, when life doesn't turn out as we had planned it. So we're going to go back to the beginning of chapter 39 for this first crossroad. Um, it turns out that Joseph, of course, is far from home, living with strangers. He's a slave in Potiphar's home. He remembers the dreams that he had as, as a child, dreams where God 
said, I'm preparing you to be a leader. <laughs> and Joseph is thinking, wow, those dreams seem to be pretty dead right now, don't they? But Joseph refuses to quit. When life doesn't turn out the way you want it, that's our first temptation. We're tempted to quit. I would have been tempted to give up. How about you? If I'd been in Joseph's place. I mean, the most natural response would have been, wow, this is not what I signed up for. You know, I may have to work for this guy, but I don't have to like it. I'm going to punch the clock. I'll go through the motions. But I'm not going to have a very good attitude. And verse 2 begins with this amazing five-word statement that we talked about last week, but it's repeated four more times in the Joseph story. Verse 2 starts out with these words, the Lord was with Joseph. And so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. You see, Joseph discovered that he wasn't alone. He was in a distant land, far from home, far from his father. Uh, uh, but he realized that somebody else was with him, inseparably, and that someone was God. So we read that Joseph works really hard, and uh, his leadership abilities blossom, and he impresses Potiphar. So in verse 6, we pick up the story. Uh, it says, so Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. That was kind of a funny add-on, wasn't it? What kind of food to eat? Potiphar had no worries. All he had to think about was, where am I going to go eat lunch? Is it going to be oregano's or in and out or borrows today? I don't know. But Joseph didn't quit. Uh, he didn't understand all the whys. But he persevered and he sensed God's presence. He, his faith even deepened. And with God's help, he persevered. He developed something we've heard a lot about lately. It's that word resilience. Resilience. And one day, God would use him to rescue his family and to serve an amazingly special role, a unique role in the redemption of the whole world. What would have happened if Joseph would have quit? Well, he could have missed that unique role that God had chosen him to play in God's vital work in the world. None of us want to do that. This is so important. It's, it's vital that we understand that no matter how visible or small our role in the world may seem. God has chosen each and every single one of us to play a unique role, to live out a unique role in his work in the world. So let me ask you, uh, did, did you ever quit something when things got hard? Okay, true confessions now. How many of you ever took piano lessons when you were growing up and quit? I'm one of those. I still remember the words of one of my bosses when I was in my accounting years, he said these words. He said, personal computers are a fad, and I am not going to learn them. Not a good choice. Not a good choice. In all seriousness, we, we have to really learn to listen to God on this one. What does he really want? And certainly there are times when God may direct us in a different direction to make changes. But there are also times when God calls us to persevere and do the hard work. But quitting always seems easier than enduring, doesn't it? It, it, it seems like it could be sweet relief. <laughs> it always seems easier to, to stomp out of the room in anger than to stay and do the hard work of seeking to resolve the conflict. It's hard work at first, isn't it, to live on a budget? <laughs> It seems so much easier in the short run just to spend whatever I want, whenever I want. But you, we all know it uh, catches up, doesn't it? In so many areas, the, the change is necessary to, to continue to be viable during this pandemic season have been tough. It would have seemed easier just to give up at times. You fill in the blank. 
Where are you tempted to quit today? God continues to lead us one step at a time, and I am so thankful for your resilience during this season. And with God's help and all the committed leadership at Light of the Desert, we've already made many changes that are going to reach more people. And I know there are more opportunities springing up every day that we're discovering. You see, strong character is forged when, with God's help, we endure through a hard season, even though we feel like quitting. That's the kind of things that builds difference-making churches. It builds deeper marriages. It builds more loving families and certainly effective organizations. When people courageously declare, even though life has not turned out like I planned, even though I'm disappointed, I want to be like Joseph. And I'm devoting myself wholeheartedly to what God wants. And when you do that, you will discover those famous, amazing five words. The Lord is with you too. Even in a distant land, whatever you're going through, you're not alone. So don't quit when God calls you to endure. Well, as we read on, Joseph does persevere, and he excels with Potiphar. We might think that the bad news is about to change. This is going to be Joseph's big break. And we pick up at the end of verse 6 and go through 9. It says, Joseph was very handsome. And uh, he was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. This is bad news. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. This is good news. And this brings us to the second crossroads. When, when life does not turn out as we had planned, we're tempted to sin. Tempted to choose sin. When we don't get the kind of circumstances we hope for, then sin will start to look really good, won't it? Reminded of the passage in Nehemiah chapter 8 uh, where Nehemiah declares, he says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. <clears throat> but the opposite is also true. A lack of joy is a place where we are most vulnerable. Joseph could have said, huh, look where God has put me, far from my family, a slave, no visible future. I will never have what my father had, a wife and children. I deserve that, don't I? So why not? Let's go for happiness in this tantalizing sort of way. I deserve it. But Joseph says no. He said, how could I betray Potiphar, who, who has entrusted me? How could I disobey God? So Joseph, we read on, refuses her continually. We think that that would be enough to dissuade her, but she finally forces the subject, and he resists one more time. In fact, he just plain runs. <laughs> Reminds me of the passage where the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 6 says, run from all these evil things. There's a time to just plain run. Stop rationalizing. Don't pretend that you're strong and can handle it. Just run, because if you don't, some of us might be at a sin crossroads right now. Maybe dishonesty at work or at home or at school. It may be sexual in nature. It might be some addictive pattern of behavior. Just want to encourage you to find a Christian friend who you can trust. Work together. Admit that you're not as strong on your own. Draw a line. Pray and pray some more. Get support from a trusted small group. We want to help you with that. Develop some accountability. No more rationalizing. Say, those days are just done. Now, we would think that Joseph would be rewarded for his faithfulness. I mean, 
He is a rock, isn't he? But Potiphar's wife, it turns out, lies and accuses him of attacking her. And Joseph goes back to jail with a, with a tarnished name. This seems like very bad news. But look at verse 25, verse 21, excuse me, one more time. Those amazing five words start the verse one more time. He said, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And that leads us to the third crossroads, the third place where we're tempted. When life does not turn out to be as we had planned, we're tempted to become very self-absorbed. We can forget about all the people around us. Life becomes all about me. Joseph had been unjustly accused, hadn't he? And now he's back in jail. And so we pick up the story in chapter 40, verse 5. It says, while they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so worried today, he asked them. It would have been very easy for Joseph to just sort of isolate himself from people, to to simply focus on himself and lick his own wounds. My world can become so small when my pain is the only pain I notice. Our heart for others dies because we're so disappointed or discouraged. But with God's help, instead, Joseph, he realizes that he's not the only one for whom life has not turned out according to plan. He even treats his fellow prisoners, these forgotten men. He treats them like human beings when no one else does. He, he, he notices them. And Joseph ends up using his wisdom to interpret a dream for Pharaoh's cupbearer. And the interpretation of the dream says that in three days the cupbearer will be freed from jail. And it comes to pass, just as Joseph has said. Joseph is now very hopeful because the cupbearer promises not to forget Joseph and he promises to provide for his release. This is good news again. We think this is finally Joseph's big break. This is finally God taking care of Joseph in the way that we think God should. Maybe justice will will finally prevail and he'll get out of prison. He can even go back home. But alas, the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months. And we realize that the cupbearer has forgotten Joseph. And that's more bad news. Well, we're going to leave Joseph here right in this place. And pick up with yet another chapter of the story next week. (laughs) Just a little foreshadowing. God's not done yet. We know that. But let's talk about us. Let's talk about us. I know that all of us have ups and downs in our life. Ever ask that question? Why God? Why this? I know that some of you are in the middle of some pretty rough stuff right now. And there's that desire to to just check out or quit or, or to look for happiness in a way that's not honoring to God. And that's right on the tip of your tongue right now. Or even simply just to live in a self absorbed, self pitying sort of way. You know, over the years, I have certainly regretted some choices that I've made like that. But here's the truth. Circumstances do not control our character. And we know that disobedience always leads to destruction. But God is not finished with any of us today. He's promised that there is always a way to work through the challenge. God is much greater than any of our challenges. And maybe we did succumb to the temptation in the past, but you know what? God is amazing and he offers forgiveness. We may have to work through some of the human consequences, but we can start fresh with God. Today is a new day. Today is a day for a fresh start. 
the story of the whole world, as I started to think of it, is, is kind of a good news, bad news story, isn't it? We remember in Genesis that, that God created the heavens and the earth, the moon and the stars and the animals and the fish, and at the culmination of it all, God made people, male and female, in his own image. And God said, that's good. But we decided that we knew better than God. And we rebelled and wanted to be our own bosses. We wanted to be our own God. That was bad. So God sent his son. God sent Jesus Christ. And we read that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Even the angels shouted, glory to God in the highest. And God said, this is very good. This is the very best thing. But people rejected Jesus, didn't they? The crowds mocked him. Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. His friends abandoned him. The government crucified him. And they laid his body in the tomb. And that seemed very bad. It seemed like the worst day in the history of the world. But on the third day, he rose. And that's off the charts good. Ever since that third day, whatever the bad news that may enter your life, we know that it has no power to separate you from the love of God. For the story of this world and the story of your life and my life, I think is a good news, bad news deal, isn't it? The bad news we know all about we tend to focus on that an awful lot. It's the, the disappointment, the, the failures, the sin, the sickness, the pain, the disease, the guilt, even, even death. But here's the good news. Here's the good news from Romans chapter 8. I just want to read it to you this morning. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth or anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because of Jesus, we can say, even in the midst of our challenges, that there is hope. And there's always a future full of promise. I want you to join me right now. Just bow your head for a prayer. Gracious God, um, this is an amazingly relevant topic this morning. It, it just it, it hits us right between the eyes. Um, there are so many times that we're tempted to, to quit or to choose something that is uh, against what we know is your will. And we know that that means destruction. Or we choose just to think of ourselves. And God, in the middle of those crossroads this morning, uh, we, d we declare that we want to choose Jesus. We want to follow Jesus with everything that we are. We want to keep our eyes glued to him. And we want to trust that he's walking with us every single day, just like you were walking with Joseph. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.